John, our first player guest joins us this week, and it's Max Scherzer. Uh, not to pat us on the back, this is a great guest and a uh, very, very smart, insightful guy. Uh, right in the middle of the CBA talks, a star with the Mets, had the year that we expected him to have, which is another great year. Great Hall of Fame career, and he's a Hall of Fame interview, too. Yeah, John, I think my back hurts from patting ourselves so much, but we'll have to live <laughs> with that. We're going to obviously talk to Max about all things Mets and free agency. A few questions in there about Jacob deGrom. And also, John and I will talk about what we learned at the general managers meetings. That's if you stick with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. So, John, uh, there wasn't a lot of action at the uh, general manager's meeting. Some we got Edwin Diaz signing. I think the biggest acquisition was I acquired COVID at the uh, at the uh, general manager's meetings. So I'm sitting in my apartment. Uh, I'm going to try to hold the cough back uh, for our show today. But uh, more important things than my health uh, happened at those meetings in Las Vegas. T tell us what you heard and what you've heard since we departed Vegas. Yeah, I mean, the Yankees are very active right now. Uh, we certainly will see what happens. But uh, I do think they feel fairly good about where the judge situation stands. We know that Hal Steinbrenner, uh, while well, he hasn't spoken to us yet, he went on Yes Network and said that he has already talked to judge since the season ended twice. And I think that's a very, very positive sign. And I've heard that they feel a little better about the situation and about their chances. And, uh, you know, that's probably the most important thing because that is their top priority. But interestingly, I have heard they've checked in on the big shortstops, at least Bogertz, Correa, and Turner, and presumably Swanson as well, though I haven't heard that. So I think that's interesting. I don't know if that's just a hedge in case Judge goes, if they're actually going to consider a uh, potential run at one of the shortstops. That certainly would be very interesting. I think they're very disappointed in the way the season ended, and they are certainly uh, going to do some interesting things, try some interesting things. And I do know that they have reached it out at least for Brandon Nimmo. We'll see what comes of that. Obviously, the Yankees made what I think is a very good trade to get Bader now in center field, so they have a center fielder. And obviously the Mets would like to get Nimmo back. We heard that there's a majority of teams interested, but I think it's interesting too that the Yankees have looked at him. They are looking for two outfielders, presumably, and hopefully that's Judge and one other. Yeah, I think this falls under due diligence to some degree. Uh, John, I think they're the Yankees. I think they always have to know what's going on in the marketplace. I think it's in their best interest to know what the prices are just in case. Uh, to monitor interest in players, to know what other teams are up to, if they could gain that intelligence. Clearly, this offseason is about judge, 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 and judge for them. I think they'd like to bring back Andrew Bentendi uh, to be that other outfielder you mentioned uh, um, as, as part of the, the, the group. Uh, you know, we're going to see on this. Uh, the fact that we haven't heard yet that Judge is sitting down with the Giants or the Dodgers, is he trying to jeter this? where he never even gets tainted in the Yankee fans' minds by talking to anyone else because he could pull up the Yankees to that level. I will say this about the shortstops. They didn't acquire a shortstop last offseason when Peraza and Volpe were further away. They might have won a championship if they got the right one. They didn't. I think it makes it harder for them to do it now. And I think while they're ready to go with the young guys, I also think they're going to trade a middle infielder. I think they talked to a lot of teams at the GM meetings about Isaiah Kaina Falefa and Glaber Torres. Glaber Torres is going to make some money this year. I think that he fits, for example, the Seattle Mariners are looking for a second baseman with some offensive upside. I wouldn't be surprised if the Yankees try to get into their deep relief pitching. Uh, with with someone like Gleyber Torres. So I think that's in play. Yeah, I mean, Ben Intendi, certainly interesting. Uh, the injury certainly hurt them. They needed those contact hitters, he and LeMahieu, and he is a fit. They do need two very good outfielders. That's what they're looking at. I've heard some speculation now, Ben Intendi not confiding in me, and we know he played in Boston and won a championship there that maybe New York is not for him. That's just speculation. And there are a couple other outfielders. There aren't a ton. There's Yoshida, who they like had a 447 on base percentage in Japan. He needs to be posted. Somebody to consider, probably more likely than a Nimmo, though. Again, it's interesting they checked in on Nimmo. Judge is the priority. I'm with you on that. I do see those shortstops as probably a long shot, but you never know. I think they are very disappointed that they 
bowed out to the Astros. The fans aren't the only ones who were disappointed. I think they were too. Yeah, one thing I keep in mind with the Astros is they did follow Correa with a rookie shortstop in Jeremy Pena and won a championship. Do the Yankees feel they could go as far with a young shortstop? They really should have played Peraza from August on last year to find out if they could do it this year. That was an unforced ever, error. Uh, as far as the Japanese outfielder, Yoshida, you mentioned, I do think one concern on him, everyone I talked to at the meetings, not a great defender. And if you're going to ask him to play left field at Yankee Stadium, that's a tough field for anyone involved. So that's interesting. And I'll throw in one other thing before I go to break here. I heard a lot of the GM meetings. Catchers, Sean Murphy of Oakland, Danny Jansen of Toronto. I think the success of guys like Rushman, Cal Riley, the, the terrific young two-way catcher is so valuable. I think those teams are going to be able to fix some of their pitching issues by going out with those two catchers. I wouldn't be, because they also have other catchers, both Oakland and Toronto to play. I see that coming. We have a lot coming this offseason. We're going to talk about that and especially about the Mets and his first season with our special guest who joins us next, Max Scherzer, on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. Welcome back to the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. Our special guest is the three-time Cy Young winner. I can't say National League or American League because he's won them in both leagues. It's Max Scherzer of the New York Mets. And actually, I would say... The most impressive thing about your Cy Youngs to me, Max, isn't just that you won them, but top five finish every year from 2013 through 2021, except for the COVID season of 2020. It speaks to incredible consistency, and we really appreciate you joining us today, Max. Hey, thanks for having me on. Uh, Max, I would begin here. We're not far removed from the World Series. And I, I looked, you made the playoffs eight times in your career with uh, multiple teams now, three different teams. So you know how fickle it could be and how tough. But I wonder as the Phillies are going through, and it's a team that you guys dominated this year, 14 and five, does it feel even more like you let some sand slip through your fingers that that could have been you? Uh, of course you think like that. I mean, <laughs> why wouldn't you? Would you think we just play baseball and we beat people and we we think, oh, they're better than us. No, of course you uh, you think you could be in that position. We definitely thought we had a team to be in that position. Unfortunately, things didn't work out the way they did. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, we faced that Phillies team a lot. And even though we had some success against them, we also recognized like they also were a team that could you know do damage in the postseason. I mean, they had the pitching. You know, they had some bullpen, they had the piece that line up, you know, they could, you know, slug. So, um, you know, and then the other way I kind of look at it is like, I'm actually kind of happy the NL East keeps putting people in the World Series. I mean, uh, the NL East is, is definitely produced some uh, good teams over the past uh, handful of years. And you know, I've gotten to be on a couple of them. And uh, so, it, it, you know, for me, I, I look at it as the NL East just keeps, you know, producing uh, great ball clubs. Max, thank you so much for coming on. You're our first ball player on. We've had Steve Cohn on, Sandy. Uh, Buck, Billy Epler, we've had a good Mets representation, but you're our first player. And I think that we've had about 25 episodes. So we really do appreciate that. Um, and I think it's a good choice on our part to have you on because you're a very honest and smart fellow. Uh, I just generally want to ask what, what you thought of your first year in New York. You've played in every quadrant of the country, Arizona, LA, Detroit, Washington. Uh, was it what you expected? Were there any surprises uh, to New York? Um, you know, I got there and, and fell in love immediately, uh, you know, especially with Billy and Buck in, in charge. Uh, I thought they were great and what they were able to do. And then really the team, I actually fell in love with the team uh, a lot quicker than I even thought I was going to. Uh, really good dudes. And we had a really good clubhouse. Uh, we really it didn't feel like we had any bad eggs. Uh, and when you have that kind of chemistry, I mean, that's when you go out there and win, you win ball games, And that, you know, that's why we won 100 ball games. We were a great team. And I thought we were a good team, to, a fun team to watch. I just felt like we played the game the right way. Uh, we had fun. I uh, didn't do anything over the top, but we, you know, gave you a reason to watch every single night. So, uh, you know, just a lot, of, a lot of good humor uh, and going on in the clubhouse with a lot of good dudes. And, uh, you know, definitely uh, can't wait for next year. Max, you came to the Mets as the one of the big free agents in the offseason. You've done this twice now where you've been you use the word dude. You had a lot of good dudes where you were the dude in the offseason. I wonder if you could. You know, we think about free agency all the time. I wonder if our fans even think about that there's an actual human being on the other side of being the dude. <laughs> what What is it like? You might know what it's like right now to be Aaron Judge or Trey Turner or Jacob DeGrom. What is it like 
when you're out there in kind of the wilderness and as of today, any of the 30 teams could sign you, but you're a big guy. What, what does it mean? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty cool to be uh, in the upper echelon of, of the free agent class. Uh, you know, you, you work so hard throughout your whole life to get yourself in this position uh, to be in free agency and you want to go out there and see what teams uh, want to do for you. Um, so it, it's definitely a wild time uh, of your life to be a free agent. Um, and then, you know, just the way free agency plays out, I mean, it, you know, things come out of nowhere you have, and all of a sudden you start talking to teams and, and then you find out you had no idea you're going to like this team. Uh, you know, I went in, you know, I'll, I'll just, you know, relay my Mets conversation. I, I didn't think there was a chance in the heck I was going to be a Met. And then I had a conversation with Steve Cohen, uh, Billy. And all of a sudden I was like, well, yeah. And my wife and I, we looked at each other afterwards, like, whoa, like the Mets are really doing something here. And, you know, just a, a couple of weeks later we saw, uh, you know, they were making, you know, big time signings and going after everything. And, uh, you know, there it was, boom, uh, let's be a Met. This is this, you know, what Steve's doing and, and you could, you really follow along. So, uh, when you actually do sign it, you just gotta be a baseball guy. If you just come in and you want to be a diva about it, you know, you can be a diva. I don't think guys really <laughs> you know, pick up on that as well. If you come in, you're just a good baseball guy and you have fun with everybody. Uh, you know, it, it's really easy to blend in at that point. So it's really about how you handle it. And, uh, really don't let anything change and just go out there and play baseball and have fun. You know, I was going to ask something else, but I I wanted to pick up on something you mentioned that you didn't think there was a chance in heck that you'd be a Met. I mean, obviously you were in Washington for almost seven years. Uh, you obviously probably formed an impression of the Mets. Uh, you know, what what was your impression and how did Steve and Billy change that impression? Um, just, the, just the way, uh, you, you know, being on DC, you know, playing against the Mets and being in the East for so long, uh, uh, you know, you you kind of saw some of the, maybe the problems from the outside. I uh, didn't really necessarily whether it was right or wrong. Uh, but when you actually got to talk to Steve, you actually talked to Billy and understand what the, what was going on, what the changes were going to be made. Hey, this is, this is what we're going. These are the guys we got and we're here to win. We're going to do every, whatever it takes to win. We're changing the culture here. We're doing absolutely everything we can. We're going to sign the right guys. We're going to build a clubhouse. Um, and you look at Billy's history about doing that with Anaheim uh you know what he was there with the Yankees you know and just kind of you kind of start getting a, a feel for what they were doing it was kind of the complete opposite of what I thought um and it completely changed everything that I was thinking uh of what the Mets direction uh was going to go um and uh you're know, going from there you kept doing my homework on the Mets and it kept you know coming back and saying no this is going to be a great situation um and so I'm actually so happy that I signed with the Mets and uh not only for that but I think one of the bigger reasons um really kind of kept my family on the East coast. Uh, I got to see my kids so much more this year. Um, and that became such a huge decision right there at the end for me, uh, being able to see my kids so much more and by playing, you know, in New York, it really allowed that to happen. So, uh, you know, you can't, that, that, that really made baseball a lot more fun that last year. Max, you signed a contract that blew away the average annual value record that had existed beforehand. It was, I think, 36 million, and you went a little over 43 million with your three year at 130 million. Do you think that's the older starting pitcher, kind of uh, the great older starting pitcher model? Uh, or do you think we can see players like Turner or Judge, somebody more in their prime, say, yeah, let's see if I could get to 45, 50? Or it's not for them. Those are the kind of guys who, like your first contract, are going to try to maximize long-term dollars. I don't know. That, that's a be beautiful thing about free agency. You can decide wherever you want it to be. Uh, everybody can answer that question however they want to answer it. Um, you know, for me, that the way I look at it is it, players as a whole, we, we help each other. So every time somebody can push the market higher, uh, that helps out everybody else. So for me, the way I look at this, I want guys to continue to beat my, you know, where I'm at on, on the market and continue to push everything higher. Cause that, that helps out everybody, it, it, you know, it, it, rising, you know, rising tides, you know, <laughs> help every single boat out there. So, um, you know, that for me, uh, you know, when you look at the players that are going to be in free agency this year, uh, you know, you want them to be able to get the most that they can because it helps out players overall. Speaking of the upper echelon of the free agent market, I should ask you about uh, Jake DeGrom. I think all the pitchers on the staff really looked up to you, Bassett in particular, but DeGrom as well. And certainly he was active for about half the year. Again, you know, maybe he's hard to read for us. I mean, you hear people like Zach Wheeler say that he liked it in New York. He did say, Jake, Jake did say a couple of times that he did like it in New York, but, you know, maybe I'm reading too much into it because I, I heard him say that he was opting out, which was the right decision. And he did do it, like he said a few times. Uh, do you think that he liked it in New York? I mean, 
for me, he's hard to read. H- how do you read that? Of course, he liked it in New York. We had a great team. I mean, if we, you know, just think of the way things go on. I, mean, I think everybody wants to try to find out where everybody's going to go every single second, what they're thinking, what's going to go on. Uh, you know, I, I get it. Uh, that's part of the game. Uh, but I wouldn't put so much stock in that. You know, you, you know, he's he's going to make a decision that's best for himself. Uh, it's for him, no, no matter what he de- decides. Uh, but no, for me, I just I love pitching with them. It was great. I love pitching with great pitchers. Uh, that's when you really get to learn more about yourself. That's when you see other guys go out there and do things a little bit differently the way you do it. Um, and the way he can go out there and dominate a game, man, he can flat out take a game over. So um, it was awesome to watch, awesome to play with, uh, and hopefully we sign him. Max, you know, you're not just any player, you know, you're, you're a hall of fame bound pitcher. You have this contract, you have great status in the game with your uh, representation in the union. I wonder if the team feels the same way. Do Billy Epler and uh, Steve Cohn in some way come to you and say, what do you think we should be doing this off season? And does it get as far as is the a must sign in your mind? Um, I've had those conversations with Billy. Uh, and so that's why I can't talk publicly about that. Uh, <laughs> oh, just, uh, it's just us on this over yeah, here. It's us talking <laughs> publicly about, you know, baseball and, you know, we, let's, Hey, I've had a conversation with Billy about what we should be doing and, you know, let's just have that conversation be public. I think that'd be, you know, <laughs> nothing could go wrong. <laughs> well, Good try Joel. Well, Good try. Well, well, I wonder then like it, is broadly, can you, you mentioned a couple of times having a great team. You want 101 games. Uh, You have a lot of free agents at a lot of facets, mainly pitching, both starting and relief. Do you have a broadly what the team must do to remain the quality it was in 2022? Sign good players. (laughs) It's not my job to go out there and do it. That I I pitch that, you know, this is Billy's job, Billy, you know, Hey, more power to you. You got a tough job in front of you, but you got to do your job. We're going to win. It takes everybody in the organization to do it. So, it, it, you know, it's, this is Billy's time. So this isn't my time. This is Billy's time. So he needs to go out there and, and make those uh, calls. You seem very involved in everything. So I'm sure they do talk to you. And well, you're not going to repeat that here. And again, good try, Joel. Uh, you know, how closely are you watching it and how worried are you? Obviously, when they needed to sign Diaz, uh, he was the best reliever in baseball last year. And Adovino and Lugo are also free agents, and they're both excellent relievers. And, of course, they picked up Carrasco's option. Uh, That was a good move, but you still look like a couple guys short in the uh, rotation with Taiwan Walker and and Bassett and DeGrom, all free agents. Um, How worried are you that uh, they're going to be able to at least replicate the team they had last year? Because obviously 101 win team, you want to be able to do that again if you can. Right. Um, you know, that's where I just have confidence in Steve and Billy to be able to get that done. Uh, you know, that they're they're grinding every single day at this. You know, for me, you know, it's kind of, you know, when I have some free time, you know, this is my off season. This is when I'm, you know, taking care of family time and and, and relaxing and enjoying myself. Uh, you know, I'm not locked in right now on the baseball side. You know, if there's there's something where we need to talk about, about different guys or different uh, things that are going on. Yeah, we can have those conversations. But, you know, I'll, I'll tell you how I see it, how I think and, you know, more importantly, different guys across the league who I faced, uh, you know, what, you know, do I think they're good ball players or not? Um, but you know, for me, I, I, I'm sitting back here, just letting them do their jobs. I, you know, I, I have confidence in them that they're going to go out there and sign the right guys. And, uh, you know, it'll be fun to watch the guys that they do sign. And fortunately we've seen two guys that we, they picked up and, uh, or I guess resigned and Carlos, and it's great to have him back in the rotation and obviously Edwin at the end. So, uh, my girls are very happy about that because they really love that Timmy Trumpet song. <laughs> <laughs> we did too. Uh, Max, we always have to be time sensitive here because who knows when we'll listen to someone will listen to a podcast. But as we're speaking tonight, they're supposed to they, they will be naming the National League Manager of the Year, the American League Manager of the Year. Your manager, Buck Showalter, is favored. You mentioned leadership people like Billy Epler and Steve Cohn. There was always questions about Buck coming back, how he mixes with players, both young and old. Uh he looks like he's going to win this award. Again, this could look bad in about 36 hours if someone listens to it. But uh, I wonder what you thought about your first year with him. And do you think he has staying power? Because that's been part of the problem with Buck is great initial success, but questions about the staying power for what Buck does. I love playing for Buck. He's a great old school manager uh, that I've gotten to play for. Uh, and he's just another one where you just love showing up every single day and, and hearing what he has to say. Uh you know, he thinks about every little detail there is. And that, that was fun to play for. Uh, 
And you got to play the game the right way. Uh, and he holds you accountable to it. So, I mean, just things that just, you know, personally, I, Tracy, you just love having in your manager and, and you know, setting that tone. Uh, so for me, it was really easy to play for him and, uh, you know, be able to go in there and have conversation with him. And man, you're going to get some, <laughs> he's going to test you in every single which way. So, uh, you know, lo- he, I thought he did a great job for us uh, and what he does every single day for all the guys up and down the roster. Uh, you know, it's different from my perspective now, you know, being on the, you know, being a veteran now, but uh, I definitely know the younger guys definitely appreciate playing for him as well. You know, I don't think anybody works harder or is more prepared than you. And I think you were probably the only pitcher who was ready to throw six innings right away. And that's with all the negotiation that you did. So I, I really don't know how you did it, but you obviously worked very, very hard in the off season to be prepared, you know, and you had a very, very good first year in New York, about what we expected, which is great. You know, that's par for you. Uh, I'm just wondering, I've heard this speculation from someone who knows you well, could be complete BS, only you would know. He thought, well, he thinks you're the best. Uh, He speculated maybe you go out too fast because obviously the last game, and of course, well, I can't really judge too much on one game. Maybe it was just one off game. The last game wasn't up to your standards. Um, do you do you think you would reevaluate that at all, or was it just an off game uh, for you at the end? Yeah, it was off game for me at the end. Uh, I actually think is quite the opposite. I I wasn't actually going out to that game and trying to go too fast. Actually, I, if anything, I was actually probably too slow. The moment uh, the postseason moments actually raise, you know, you raise up for those postseason moments. Um, I was actually trying to stay at a pretty even keel, even even level. So it was actually kind of the opposite of what I, usually happens when I get into those situations. Um, you know, that's that's probably fair criticism to say overall that, you know, there's times where I go out there and I can be a little bit too amped up and I go a little bit too hard early in the game and I can get out of whack of it. Uh, but that's not how I would characterize, uh, you know, the start against the San Diego. Uh, actually, it's just the opposite, in my, in my opinion. Max, uh, talking about that, the durability thing, you you were on the injured list twice this year. Uh, you still had, as John pointed out, uh, a terrific season for the 23-24 starts you made. You'll pitch next year at age 38-39. Do you think we've learned something? We're seeing Justin Verlander is pitching well late in his career, still a power pitcher. Adam Wainwright, not a power pitcher, still pitching at a high level as he gets to 40. Clayton Kershaw, We're going to have to ask this question about about Jacob deGrom. Has something been unlocked that the older starting pitcher knows something about his repertoire, his body, et cetera, that you can sustain being a power pitcher this late in your career for at least another two years? Because that's what's on your contract with the Mets, correct? Yeah. um, For me, the way I look at it is what I do in the offseason shows up during season. I'm going to continue to work as hard as I ever have uh, to go out there and have the best year possible as I possibly can uh, in 2023. Um, you know, obviously the way 2022 ended, uh, stinks, uh, no one in that clubhouse likes that we lost in the first round. We thought we had a team that could go all the way. Um, and so you got to take it upon yourself to go out there and be the best you can. You can't go out there and, you know, try to have the same year. You actually got to go out there and have a better year. So, um, there's definitely things I've been thinking about over the past month here of, of things that I've identified where I feel like I can be better, uh, continue to, uh, you know, elevate my game and, and continue to evolve as a pitcher and continue to go out there and have better results. Uh, you know, every single year I continue to do that. I continue to add something to my game. Yeah. You can talk about numbers and this and that. Uh, but the numbers are just a result of the process of, of myself of going out there and identifying those uh, areas of my game that I can get better at. And so, um, you know, 2022, I thought there was things I was doing with baseball that, uh, you know, for me, that was the best, you know, kind of execution wise I've had in my career. So uh, I firm, firmly, firmly believe if I can go out there and be better in 2023, it would be in a little bit different way, but what I got to be able to do with the baseball can be, if I do a little bit different way, guys haven't seen that before out of me. So it could actually be to my advantage. So for me, I'm always looking at how I'm going to evolve, how I'm always going to get better. It's a never ending process. Uh, and so for me, I just concentrate myself and going out there and doing what I can be doing what I can do to be at my physical best. Now, this is a pretty specific question, but the Mets do have to fill out about half of the rotation. And I'll ask you about Justin Verlander. You pitched with him for quite a while in Detroit. Uh, you know, one of the best uh, pitching rotations that we've ever seen. Uh, had you two on on there. A lot of people are expecting him to go back to Houston following the World Series win. Um, the Yankees did try to get him last year, as has been documented. And, uh, you know, they heard, you know, obviously we know that he's married to a model and maybe he wants to go to New York. And, you know, the way it played out, 
they felt in the end that he really wanted to go back to Houston. They didn't want to go to the Yankees. Uh, do you have any feel for whether he'd want to go to New York uh, since he is a free agent? Yeah, I have no idea. You asked me to speculate on people's free agencies. I have no idea. Uh, I'm sitting here in Jupiter enjoying myself. I don't, I, I, I don't even know what Jake's going to do. I don't know what Spurs going to do. I don't know what you know the, all these other guys are going to do. So I, I get we all want to play the game so much of where is everybody going to sign. And somehow I know where everybody's going to sign. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't know where everybody's going to sign. Uh, that, that's what makes it fun is uh, to watch where everybody falls and, and where the teams stack up and, you know, which teams are stacking up to try to win it all. And so hopefully uh, here in, uh, with the Mets, you know, we're the team that does it. You know, you mentioned this name a few times earlier. And as again, a guy who very involved with the Players Association over the years, what you guys always want is a free market where teams aggressively bid to try to get the best players and best teams possible. And it seems like after a long time of not having that on one side of New York, the Mets have that with Steve Cohn. You mentioned his name earlier. I believe, tell me if this is wrong, that in some ways you you, you got to this story. You had said to him at that initial meeting, like, I don't, I, I've heard terrible things about here. Like, I don't know that I want to be here. And he said, well, part of making it better is you, right? Like you, you would help. I wonder what your impression is of Steve Cohn and what it means moving forward for the game to have someone like him in New York operating the way he does. I, I mean, I just think it's good anytime you have an ownership that's absolutely committed to winning. And he's going to he's going to bring in the best players and and find a way to uh, compete for a World Series, especially in a big market. Uh, you know, that's fun to, to be in a part of a team that can do that, to be a part of an organization that's going to uh, spare no expense and do things the right way. Uh, you know, as a player. Uh, that's all you can ask for is your ownership is to be able to, go, to be able to put forth the best, best product possible. Uh, and if you have, you know, and it's, it, it happened over last year, like, Hey, we, we see X, Y, Z, we need Z to be a little bit better. And of course Z got better. Um, it doesn't happen like that when you talk to other guys around the league. And so, um, you know, when you, that's why, you know, I feel like it's so important for us to go out there and have, have good seasons, continue to play at an extremely high level, um, because we want to do it the right way. We want to be the template of, hey, this is what baseball can be and the best best version of baseball as an organization. If the Mets can be that, and we want to make the Mets, uh, you know, that successful of an organization. So it, it's a total team effort <laughs> beyond just, you know, the team, uh, the owner, the GM, everybody and, and the manager, and, you know, having everybody, um, you know, pulling in, in the same way and making everything the best best way possible. Uh, that's the best thing for the, everybody involved. You know, I, I wasn't quite sure how you did it. I mean, you prepared for the season, were ready to throw six innings from the start, and you were right in the middle of the CBA talks. Uh, you were right at, in that leadership group of about six to eight guys. And I know uh, things got heated at, at certain times, and there was one time where you guys made a, a decent move and MLB uh, came back and made a very, very small move. And I, I know you it, you it upset you quite a bit. Um, how, how did you feel about the whole negotiation? And, you know, by the end, I know all of the leadership declined the offer. I thought you guys did well. I mean, you know, that threshold came up, up fairly significantly from what I could tell. But what did you think in the end, how it played out? How it, I guess we're, we won't know exactly until, the, you know, several years, the, the five years of the CBA. We won't know. But how do you feel about it now? I know all of the leaders were not in favor at that moment, but do you feel better about it now? Um, probably not. Uh, just cause I know we were right there on the front lines and, you know, speaking of, for the subcommittee and the conversation, I'm not going to say exactly what was said, but, um, I know we were neck deep into it. We saw everything that was going on. We, we had the numbers in front of us and where we thought, uh, the ultimate end goal should be, uh, the rest of the league didn't, uh, you know, that's the way it goes. I'm not here to <laughs> litigate old wounds. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it is what it is. I mean, you, you got to go out there and play and, and you know, be in those positions. Uh, you know, it's kind of like politics. Uh, I don't really want to get all my politics out there. But, you know, th when you talk about the CBA, it's kind of the, the politics of baseball of, you know, what's going on with, you know, you know, minimum players, you know, with our players, with free agent players and how that all fits together and make everybody happy. Uh, you can't make everybody happy. And so you got to figure out what what's going to be, you know, the best system possible. And so uh, for me, that's what I was, you know, kind of focusing on of, you know, what's the best best system for baseball? What's the best system for the players um, and for the fans as well? Um, creating the most entertaining, you know, product out there. Because at the end of the day, no matter what happens, we have to, you know, like we're in the entertainment industry. 
we have to make sure that people want to tune in and, and are excited by, you know, what players they see, you know, playoff formats uh, and, and that it's a highly competitive game and, and ma making sure that that competition is, is at the first, at the fore forefront of everybody's mind that everybody's trying to absolutely win every single day. And so, uh, you know, when you think of the ba baseball game from that, from that lens, um, you know, that, that was kind of what, that's how I was viewing it of trying to make the, the game the best way, the, you know, the best version of itself. You know, Max, if I could just go back, I, I have one other Met thing I did want to ask you about, because I think it's so important for the 2023 Mets. You actually pitched to Francisco Alvarez in the, in the, uh, on a minor league rehab, and you seem to come back very enthused about him as a player. Do you think he, it, it, there's not a lot of history of 21 year old catchers catching full seasons, uh, his offense seems like it's going to not going to be beyond question. Do you think he's up to being the primary catcher for the 2023 Mets? You know, it's tough to a hundred percent give you an answer there saying yes, he is, or no, he's not. I think it's somewhere in between and you got to just let, you know, the player dictate that, you know, when he comes into spring training, uh, you know, just see where he's at. Yeah. You know, now he's gotten a taste of the big leagues and, and you know, he got to see that right at the end and in the playoffs and, you know, how motivated is he to continue to move forward? You know, sometimes you've seen players who get the taste and all of a sudden they think they're good. Um, and, you know, they, they think they can just show back up. I was one of those players at one point in time. Uh, or do you come back and, and you just absolutely put your you know nose in the dirt and you work absolutely even harder than you ever before and you come out and you're even better and then you can handle that position. So, um, you know, it just depends on what where he's at, uh, you know, in spring training and moving forward. Uh, but I mean, there's no, no dying. He, he's a very talented uh, 20 year old who's got a tremendous bat. And, you know, it's a very exciting way, he, he, you know, what his future could be. You know, we've hit on a few of the free agents. I didn't mention uh, Brandon Nimmo. What were your impressions now playing with Nimmo? He seemed to have really improved on both sides of the ball, which is not that easy to do at this level. Um, you know, you feel hopeful, too, that he could come back. He seemed really to enjoy himself, love New York. He, you know, he's from Wyoming, but love New York. And uh, obviously, you, you got to see Marte. You know, obviously there's an option for the Mets. If Nimmo does leave, they could move Marte to center potentially. But what were your impressions of uh, Brandon? Yeah, I think, you know, we're so close or we're so quick to say after a player plays like one or two years in the big leagues, we know exactly what he is. And I mean, he, he, we're going to use the models and we got his career mapped out exactly the way it's going to be and pay him this because, you know, he hit this at age 26. So that's that's him. And actually you can get a lot better in years five, six, seven, eight. Uh, it's a never ending thing. And we try to pinhole everybody into what they're going to be by the first couple of years of what they do. So when you see, you know, Nemo, when he goes out there and he continues to evolve his game, he continues to be a better defensive center fielder. He continues, you know, to get on base at a high level, you know, and continues to hit and continues to become a better player. You know, those are, that's the exciting time. Uh, you know, when kind of, he, he continues to elevate his game and find new ways to be better. Uh, you know, having to face him over, over the years, uh, you know, he, he has such good strike zone recognition, uh, to actually face him now to get, you know, his take on what it was like, uh, you know, those were good battles we had between us and to watch him continue to grow as a hitter and grow as a player. Uh, those are exciting things. Uh, I love seeing that out of, uh, guys as, as they continue to get better and, uh, you know, being a center fielder, it's a very demanding, uh, you know, job, uh, to be out there every single time. Uh, you know, the stress it puts on your legs. So uh, for him to be able to go out there and be, and finally have a durable year, I think that's what he's always been itching for is to have that durable year. Uh, and when he's durable and he's playing every single day, he, it shows you he, he, he's a heck of a ball player. He can really impact the game in a lot of different ways. Uh, and he was great for us last year. So, yeah, I mean, it's just another guy that you would like to see back. Max, as I think about 2023 and you, it seems to push up against two things when I think about you. I think of you as an old school player. But I also think of you as somebody who refuses not to get better. And you're going to push up against new rules next year that it probably the old school doesn't like. But the new school is, well, I'm going to figure out a way to make the best of this. Take whatever you want from the new rules that apply to pitchers. You know, you're going to have to work quicker, 15 seconds without someone on base, 20 with, bigger bases, fewer throwovers to try to promote the running game. What does Max Scherzer think of this? And what do you do in the offseason to prepare for that? Well, as we talk about pitch clock here first, I, I actually think I'm going to be, uh, this is going to benefit me. I really do think I'm, I'm going to have success uh, with the clock uh, and I'm actually going to be able to use the clock to my advantage. Now, given that, I don't think this is the right way to go. Um, but uh, no, I think what you're talking about here, these are all things that, you know, you have to keep in, I mean, as you're going into next year and spring training is going to be fascinating to, to play these out. 
uh, yeah, you got to work quick. Uh, and finally, the, the the pace is out of the the hitter's hands. Uh, I think part of the reason why uh, pace was so slow is I, I mean, I really feel like majority of the problem was the hitters. Uh, you know, they were taking too long in between the bats. Uh, at least from my you know from my vantage point, I mean, a pitcher if you allow the pitchers to work quick, pitchers would work quick. It's the fact that hitters were had the unlimited ability to call time and slow the game down to their their pace whenever they wanted. And so I feel like that's just what got amplified throughout the whole game that the hitters kept slowing the game down. The fact that the hitter can only call timeout once and then a bat, that's an incredible rule, uh, you know, to have. Uh, now, if, you know, as a pitcher, if I work quick, uh, I can make the hitter completely uncomfortable and he only has one chance at a timeout. Not to mention that there could be a nine second delta uh, from when the, I could actually pitch the ball to holding the ball to when I actually have to pitch. Um, that can really screw up a hitter's timing as well. So that that's really those two aspects of the pitch clock, not even a clock. The fact that the hitter only has one timeout and I have a really of a nine second delta to work with. Uh, I feel like those two things alone can really work to my advantage. Uh, and, you know, with the pitch count system, I can get those signs so much faster and quicker. Um, it allows me to work quick. And so I feel like I'm going to be able to withstand the pitch clock that changes within the game and be able to evolve with it and really use it to my advantage uh, because I really feel like it's going to put the hitter at a disadvantage. Uh, Max, uh, this will be my last question. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this and in, in your rare off time. So thank you so much. And, you know, it was a pleasure this whole year in New York, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to say this about it. all the great pitchers, but many of them, some of them are a little bit of prima donnas. You are not like that at all. In fact, I can remember a game where you and the Joel and I were bantering before your start, probably an hour before your start at the Yankee stadium. And there are many starting pitchers who would do that. And uh, we do really appreciate uh, all of the cooperation that you do give. So I, I do want to ask you, uh, you, you, you don't even have to know you to know you're the one of the most competitive people in the country. I mean, we don't have to be in the clubhouse. You can see it on the field. Uh, one thing I, I sense, though, is you do have the record now for the salary. It seems like you want to lose that record. I don't know. <laughs> Am I right there? There are a couple guys, I would say Judge and DeGrom, probably have an outside shot at it. Are you rooting for them or not? I, I don't care. I hope they do. I mean, I hope they do. It would be good good for the players overall if they do uh, and continue to uh, push the market upwards. Um it's not like I'm. That's a record to hold on to that I gotta have. No, it, okay. I'll be happy for whoever. Uh, I'll be cheering for them. Whoever can break it, but uh, yeah, that's just for somebody else to do. You know, Max, I second what John said about the cooperation, but also making us think. I hope I'm not putting you on the spot because you said something fascinating to me one time when we were talking, and I'd like to go out with you. You suggested a rule change using the double hook but with a twist. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I, I I want you to say it on our podcast so that I don't actually steal it and act like it's mine because I liked it <laughs> so much. Tell them the rule that you would like to put in place to use the double hook. Yeah, so let's get the full context here of what, what we're kind of talking about here. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think connecting the DH and the, and the starting pitcher together would be a good thing. Um, and Really, really why I want to see this is because I think they're, the problem with baseball right now is that we're losing the starting pitcher. The starting pitchers are pitching fewer innings than ever. Um, and I think I think from a fan's perspective, um, you know, when they watch baseball, they, they enjoy the starting pitcher matchup. Uh, they want to know how this pitcher is going to pitch against this lineup. And they kind of can envision, you know, what's going to happen so much better when there's only one pitcher. You know, they're, you know the, the starting pitcher is going to go out there and make kind of a full start. Um, and so from the fans perspective, I think that that's best for the game. That, that's what the game should be striving for. Um, the fact that we've seen this, uh, you know, kind of the bullpen, it, it, I understand why the, the starters role has diminished throughout the game. Um, you know, we see the numbers on the third time through the order and, and we have so many bullpen guys now that are throwing 95 with, you know, awesome breaking balls, um, you know, more so than there ever was, you know, call it 10 years ago. So, I understand why managers and, and front offices make that decision uh, and, and why we've seen the starter, uh, you know, fade forever, you know, for a lack of a better term here. Um, but I actually think from a whole, from, from a macro standpoint of view, we should be trying to come up with rules to make the starter actually stay in the game longer. 
Um, I think that's better for the game. So if you're actually, so I have had to think about this so many different times, so many different ways and, and kind of where I've, I, I've ended up in, you know, different rule th rules that I've heard uh, is actually connecting uh, the DH and the starting pitcher in that uh, instead of a true double hook situation uh, where you immediately, if you pull the starter, you lose your DH. Um, I understand that, but I also think the DH being having a DH in the game uh, is a good thing. So uh, the way I see it is let the starting pitcher earn the full time DH. And so I kind of call it a, a qualifying start that the starter can go out there and, you know, if he throws six innings, no matter what his pitch count is, okay, he's made a start. If he's gone out there and thrown, you know, let's call it four or five innings, but he's thrown 100 pitches. Well, that's a real start. Like he, I've gone out there, if I've thrown 100 pitches, like that's all you can ask for me to do. Uh, that's a real start. Um, and then the third third thing uh, that kind of qualifying for me that, you know, I look at, you know, when you think about making a rule like that is to say, all right, if I've given up four runs, that also, you know, counts as a qualified start. You know, the other team has had their shot at me. I've given up four runs. If, if the game dictates that I can come out of the game, it, you know, I should be out of the game. OK, I come out of the game. We should be allowed to keep our DA. So what, I think the start that kind of frustrates everybody is when you see a starter go five innings give up, you know, one run and he's got 75 pitches and they're pulling him because he's the third time in the lineups coming through. And to me, that's not like a real start. Like, no, like we should be as a game. When I mean, you think about baseball as a whole, like, no, we should be pushing those starters back out there in those situations. Like those guys should be going out there for the six. You should be trying to get a hundred pitches every single day out of your starters. And if you had that rule in the books, you're going to go back down to the minor leagues and, and basically force developed starters to start. You know, hey, look, you got to be able to throw 100 pitches every single time you go out there. And if you you start demanding that from, you know, to be a young starter in a game, uh, that's going to just naturally develop. And so, you know, it kind of piggybacks on to, hey, we want to, you know, at the game, we want to see more balls in play. We want to see fewer strikeouts. Well, if you want to have that happen, you know, this is another way to address that. You know, you're going to have the starter start more. You're going to have fewer relievers coming in trying to strike everybody out. So you're really attacking the problem, a lot of problems and with one kind of rule change here. Now I get it's kind of a, a slightly drastic change, but it from the surface of it, it really wouldn't you really wouldn't notice it uh, when you would go into a start. It would be the strategy of how you develop your starters. Like that's where the whole you know mindset would change. That we're no longer just trying to have somebody throw 98 and just blow it out for five innings. No, we're trying to develop an actual pitcher starter. He's got to go 100 pitches and and teach teach young guys. To, to be able to go deep into a game. I see I'm a product of, of being able to, when I was in Detroit of going out there and, and saying, no, you're going to go through three times through the order and, and fail and then be allowed that opportunity to go, go back in those situations and then learn from that and get better from it. We're so afraid. The, I feel like the game is so afraid today to have a young starter. And I've seen this on young, multiple young guys where they, you know, they throw four innings, 80 pitches and they're out of the game. And it's like and because they've given up a few handful of runs like, no, let that guy finish like he needs to he needs to know what it's like to get beat in the big leagues and still have to pitch. Um, so, you you develop so much so much because of that. So to me, I think if you can encourage pitchers to continue to pitch 100 pitches, I think that'd be a good thing for the game. Well, I, look, maybe I'm thick I, and I haven't given this as much thought as you have. I've given it almost no thought. But exactly what is the reward then if he does? The DH you... stays in the game the whole way. So if yeah. he, you know, the, okay. you, the DH that begins the game, see if I got this right, Max, stays in the game the whole way if the pitcher clears six innings, clears 100 pitches, or allows four runs. So yeah. it ties it into a real start. Again, I'm just I trying to show it. you, Max, that when we actually talk, I actually remember what we talked about. Yeah. That was months <laughs> ago. And I really love the idea of tying the DH to a to a old-fashioned start. Like, you know, you, you your starter has to earn it. Now, the starter could give up four runs in one inning, in the first inning, but that is the, like to Max's point, they get a shot at the starter, and so you get to keep your DH. And I thought that was more an innovative way to think about getting more out of the starter and, like, you're in peril of not having your full-time DH if you don't do it. Did I have right. that right, Max? Yeah, correct. It, it, it's a basically if the starter goes out there and makes a start, you keep your DH the full time. If if you go five, if you want to play the game where you go five innings, seventy five pitches, one run, um, and you want to pull the starter, okay, lose your DH. If if it's that important, uh, lose your DH. Well, let's hope that among our listeners is Rob Manfred in Central Baseball because <laughs> I love that rule. Uh, and by putting it on the record here today, I can't steal it fully, Max, but I will be using it at some point. <laughs> 
And John and I truly do want to thank you for your, you know, as with that, your insights and your time as always, and for joining us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. John, you pointed it out during the interview. Max was our first player guest. I don't think we could have gotten much better player guest than Max Scherzer, who's uh, intelligent, insightful, and worth the time. Uh, what'd you take out of that interview? Yeah, terrific. Um, he loved his first year in New York. That's great for all of us to hear. And it was interesting that he went into the Zoom call with Steve Cohn being skeptical about the Mets based on his years with the Nats. And you could understand why he might be, but it seemed like some of it turned around on that Zoom call. Certainly the offer couldn't have hurt, but uh, he feels like he made the right decision and he seems to be very optimistic about the Mets going forward. They have a lot of openings and uh, they need to do a lot of stuff, but uh, I think he feels very good about the situation and his decision. John, you know, that's what I took out of it also. And what I took out of it is he went into that meeting not believing he'd be a New York Met. In fact, from what I understand, not wanting right. to be a New York Met. So I would keep that in mind, Yankee, Met fans, fans of all type, that Jacob deGrom and Aaron Judge might be hearing things over the next weeks and months that they weren't expecting to hear from various teams, maybe even teams they didn't anticipate. Once you allow your player out into the free agent wild, as we learned last year when Max Scherzer ending up where he didn't expect and Freddie Freeman not going back to the Braves, that once it opens up, everything is in play. Free agency, very unpredictable. I mean, I talked to a Braves person the other day and he said, and maybe just remembering the Freeman situation, you know, now that free agency has started, you know, we really don't expect that we're going to be able to keep Swanson. I've thought all along, being a Georgia guy, that he'd probably go back. But, you know, you've got a lot of teams telling you great stuff when you've had a very good year and you're a terrific player. We've Got quite a market, not just Judge and DeGrom. Those four shortstops uh, should be quite interesting. You know, John, when I spoke to Alex Anthopoulos at the GM meetings, I spoke to him for quite a while, and he was talking about what Ron Washington thought of Vaughn Grissom being able to play shortstop. I was like, for the first time, I was like, hmm, I wonder if Dansby Swanson's coming back or not now, because that was an awful lot of time on Ron Washington and Vaughn Grissom, you know, just to am amplify your point that – I think probably four weeks ago, five weeks ago, we would have said, oh, come on, Dansby Swanson, he's from suburban Georgia, he's had a great run there, was a championship shortstop there. Again, once this process begins, everything is in play. And we've got 11 teams right now in that shortstop mix, if you count the Yankees too, and you know, I'm even hearing a little scuttlebutt about the Padres. I you wouldn't think so. They, we never thought they would sign Hosmer, then they signed Machado, they signed Tatis to the big deal. They acquired Soto. Uh, you know, there are 11 teams and there are four great shortstops out there. Uh, it should be quite a game of, uh, say, musical chairs, but there are seven teams that are not going to get one of those shortstops. Yeah, I think Tatis Jr. ends up in the outfield. I sure. guess that's something to see at another time, another place. Uh, John, we are not on next week uh, for Thanksgiving, but we'll be back as always, on the show uh, with Joel Sherman and John Heyman every Tuesday. We always want to thank Andrew Hartz and Jake Brown for producing our show. Uh, subscribe to the show on, pod, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Give us a five-star rating on Apple and Spotify. And uh, John, I wish you a happy Thanksgiving to you and uh, Kareen and Maya and your family. And to all our listeners, thank you for joining us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman.